We're here to talk about uh, RFPs in this session today, um, how to get uh, better requirements uh, for more accurate RFPs and responses. So um, we're going to be talking a lot about the RFP process, both from the industry perspective and kind of from the government perspective. So starting off, thanks to all of our sponsors that are um, you know, making this event possible, right? Making it free for, for everybody. Uh, if you have a chance, make sure you stop by the booths, say hi, thank the sponsors, um, you know, they're the ones that make this possible. Alright, starting off with some introductions, you have myself and Brian Lacey, uh, we're from Obomo. Uh, I'll let Brian do his introduction first. Hi, my name is Brian Lacey, I'm the CEO here at Obomo. I've worked here for 13 years, and I've seen all aspects of developing Drupal websites from being a designer, creating design teams, uh, doing project management, responding to RFPs, RFIs, and doing pricing strategies. Uh, I've been lucky to work with Jason for over 10 years, and we've developed some of the largest Drupal websites, including NASA, uh, USGS, NOAA Fisheries, and FERC, to name a few. Uh, and we've seen a lot of different types of RFIs and RFPs come out that range from just sketches with bullet points to 100-page documents with very detailed requirements and uh, user scenarios in them. Uh, but what we want to go over today with you are things that we'd like to see added to those so we can be more accurate and also creative in the proposals we get back to you uh, to make sure that we're answering the mail, getting everything done, uh, and also bringing value to the uh, citizen. Jason? Awesome. <clears throat> so yeah, my name is Jason Fulte. I'm the CEO from Obama. Brian said I've been with for 10 years and been involved in the, you know, pretty much every federal project that Obama has had in the last 10 years. Um, in the early days, I was actually you know, writing code and doing deployments to some of those government sites. And then in more recent years, um, really more overseeing from kind of both the business and technical perspective, helping to recruit the talent project managers, developers that work from Obama, really building out the teams, and then, you know, in the more recent years, working a lot with the RFP process, and, you know, reviewing them, helping to, you know, craft from Obama's responses, helping to do pricing, so, and I've seen a huge variety, like, <laughs> RFPs are not created equally, they vary drastically from one government agency to the next, you know, the amount of information provided, the requirements, um, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. So, before we get started, I do kind of want to pull the audience to kind of see who we have uh, in attendance today. So, show of hands, anybody in the audience here who work on the government side, like in procurement as a core contracting officer? Okay, got a couple of people. So, a lot of this uh, presentation is just talking towards you. And then, uh, show of hands, you know, who's here? I'm assuming everybody else is on the industry side, right? You're responding to RFPs, okay, yeah. And, and or in, involved in delivery at some level, okay. Good to know, all right. We're talking to both groups in our presentation today, but um, yeah, as you'll see, a lot of this is kind of us, uh, I think, talking more to the government uh, about what we see. So, before we dive in, what to expect? Um, you know, the title of our presentation is, you know, Drupal Requirements for More Accurate RFPs and Responses. Have that crossed out here because a lot of what we're talking about is universal to really any kind of software development RFP. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be Drupal specific. We are going to get into some, some things that are Drupal specific, but a lot of things, whether it's infrastructure, DevOps, tooling, project management methodology, a lot of that stuff is to be applied to non-Drupal projects and RFPs as well. Um, we do have the presentation uh, divided up into four key areas. Uh, we're going to talk about technical requirements, then like design, customer experience stuff, then like business level requirements, and then last like pricing and budget. Um, we're going to talk about the challenges we see from the industry side of things, right? And a lot of that revolves around sometimes lack of clarity or you know maybe misleading or, or contradictory information that we've seen in RFPs. Um, solutions for addressing that. I mean, and that usually revolves around you know taking advantage of that phase where you get to ask questions back to the government, or you know when you're making your response, writing in those assumptions and exceptions, right, to help you know clarify things. And then yeah, we're also going to talk about you know suggestions and benefits for the government. If you were to you know take this presentation and you know pull some pieces from it to incorporate it in the solicitations. You know what benefit you would see from that. 
Um, and then at the end, we'll have some kind of some do's and don'ts, and again, that's kind of targeted towards our um, government attendees. All right, so first section, technical requirements. Um, to clarify, when we're talking about technical requirements, uh, in this context, we really mean uh, the types of things that would need to be delivered or work on by a software developer, a software engineer, a system engineer, somebody that is, you know, fingers on the keyboard, writing code, committing code, deploying, right, doing that technical kind of work. Um, so, you know, that's a really broad area, right, technical requirements. And so we've got it, you know, divided up into these seven areas. There's probably a few more that we could have added. Um, a lot of a lot of information and content here in the, in the technical requirements section. So I'm gonna jump right in. So the first one is Drupal or really any application functionality. If you're putting out a solicitation for software development, right? These are the kinds of things that I think industry would really like to see, you know, spelled out and clarified in that RFP, RFI. You know, content editing workflows. How many users are you gonna have? What are the you know, stages of getting a piece of content created and getting it reviewed, moderated through that workflow process and actually getting published. Having that spelled out in an RFP like helps us understand what kind of workflow we're gonna have to build out for you. Uh, digital asset management, right? Drupal Media is great. Some government agencies have their own damn solution. And you know, if you have one, you know, let us know what it is. If there's an existing Drupal module, we'll know, we know that we'll be able to leverage it. If there's not, you know, we're going to have to write something custom. You know, custom effort means more, uh, more time, you know, higher price. Web forms, any kind of, you know, input form, you need to know if there's a solution there, what the requirements are going to be, if, you know, we're going to have to document things around security, if the, the form is going to be collecting PII, you know, all, you know, details around forms and, and what if any customization you're going to need. Authentication and access levels, again, how many users, content editors, what you know, what do you see as like the permission levels? Maybe it's just two or three, maybe there's five or six. Is your agency divided into different groups? And then and several groups need to have access to some content, not others. How many of those groups are there? All valuable information, you know, in, in the RFP to just know what you know industry needs to build for you. Um, the next two custom integrations, hey guys, you see this a lot, like where there's kind of a minimal information, lack of clarity. Just you know, does your, does your group or site or the site you're going to use to build need to pull information from somewhere or publish an API for say the general public or you know some other some other agencies like knowing what those are. If you you know, and is there a spec for that API, right? Or is it need to be created from scratch? You know, those are the kind of details uh, we need to know. Search capabilities, right? I mean, every Drupal site is going to have keyword search, but if you need like, more advanced capabilities, facet search, things like that, we we'll just assume that every search solution has facet built into it. So, um, benefits for the government on, on all this stuff, you know, more precise estimate, right? We're, you know, we'll be able to tell if we have details around these requirements, whether we need more front-end developers or back-end, more DevOps people, security people, whatever. Um, if we have a clear understanding of the solution that you're looking for from, from the description, we might be able to give you a response that shows you examples of similar work. You know, so that, you know, helps uh, lower risk and prove that, you know, we can deliver something, and we have already delivered something that, uh, you know, similar size and scope, um, and you know, give you better recommendations, or recommendations for better solutions. All right, our next technical requirement area is around infrastructure, hosting, DevOps. It's interesting sometimes how, huh, you know, you'll have a uh, solicitation to take over uh, the, the, you know, maintenance of a site, have no idea where it's hosted. That's actually really useful information. Is it hosted on Aquia? Is it in a government data center? Is it in one of the major clouds, Azure or AWS, right? You know, if we're taking over the maintenance of the site, knowing where it's hosted has an impact on what we have to do to get, you know, updates deployed to it, right? So 
you know, just having even some minimal detail about that. You know, is there an existing appointment process? Is it, you know, a very name? Like, do you already have uh, CIC pipeline tools that you're already using? And so, you know, the benefit of disclosing that information is we can make sure that we provide somebody who has the experience with the tools that you're already using, right? Um, things around disaster recovery, high availability. Uh, a big point of confusion, I think, <laughs> for industry a lot of times in some of these RFPs is who is responsible for what, right? And we see this in your, this is going to be a common theme in, in some of the slides coming up is that division of labor, division of responsibilities, you know, who is responsible for the infrastructure, who is responsible for security, right? Where do they overlap? Are there points of contact between those groups? Um, so this is just one area where knowing that, hey, there's some other group that we're going to have to coordinate with on the infrastructure side of things. Again, benefits for the government, better expectations, the teams understand where they overlap, who's responsible for what, just creates better communication, better project flow. Next one is uh, around security compliance, right? Um, seeing some interesting RFPs that, you know, <laughs> I always find it interesting that uh, some solicitations will want to put the, a single contractor in charge of not only development, but also security, which is weird to me that you would ask the company building the site to also tell you that it's secure, because if I'm buying a house, I hire somebody to, to inspect the house, and then they say, here's all the things that are wrong, let me fix them for you. It seems like a conflict of interest, right? So, you know, usually there's a separation there where the, 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 there's a different contractor or a different group, sometimes it's internal in the government that, you know, is verifying and validating the security of what's being built. So, again, just knowing what the structure is there, what are the scanning tools, you know, if there is a tool that's being prescribed, we can incorporate it into the deployment pipeline and have the scan on automatically. Obviously, the you know, application development team is going to remediate any issues or findings, but there should be, you know, someone else involved just kind of, again, in that conflict of interest uh, standpoint. So, yeah, benefits again, clear vision responsibilities, you know, establishing, establishing that close relationship with the security team to make sure that, you know, if they identify a vulnerability, we can have some back and forth on what an uh, acceptable remediation is going to be. All right, uh, next one, operations and maintenance. Um, so whether you're, you know, your solicitation is about building something new from scratch or taking over an existing site, it's almost always, you know, some section about operations and maintenance. And providing clarity on, you know, what that means is really important because we see it vary a lot. Like, there's some solicitations that really expect and want a minimal budget for operations maintenance and they just want to keep the lights on. Well, what does that mean, right? Keep the lights on. Like, you have to have security updates, um, but, you know, it can really mean different things to different people. We start talking about keep the lights on, and so it's kind of spelling out what the expectations are, you know, beyond just keeping the site up, right? Or do you want minor enhancements? And if so, you know, do you have the budget for one full-time developer or two or you know, project management, right? So, you know, knowing what the expectations are so that it can be priced out and budgeted correctly, right? If you, if you want, you know, maintenance to include general application updates, uh, monitoring, right? Who's responsible for monitoring the site and resolving any uh, uptime issues. So, again, just clearly identifying the division responsibilities. Next one is about uh, SLAs and support. So, seeing a lot more SLA type uh, requirements in RFPs. You know, one that we see, I think, a little bit more is like the, the 24 by 7 by 365 support. And, you know, for government folks here, I would say, you know, really consider if that is truly is a need for your site because if the entire you know development team is three or four people and you add 24 by 7 support as a requirement you basically are adding it, it 
it requires at least three people to, to fulfill that, right? To fulfill the 24 by 7. So you could be doubling the size of the team, doubling the, the price, the, the budget for it. And is it actually, could you get by with just normal business hours support, or maybe extended business hours, or maybe normal business hours, but you know, six times a year there are, we need extended support because of certain events, right? All that kind of stuff could be spelled out to where you don't have to ask for 24 by 7, but you can get, you know, the, the coverage that you need and still, you know, keep the budget. Um, another thing is, you know, spelling out what support is and isn't, right? So, you, you know, the last four goals here, support versus help desk versus content management, ongoing training, incident response, like, we've seen those things be included as part of support and not be, right? Some uh, agencies may have their own enterprise help desk and they will turn over password resets and new account creation to the enterprise help desk, right? Sometimes they you know, need that level one support from the application development team, right? Content management is another big one, like, you know, are you gonna need help getting things posted, right? Do you need actually to have a content person as a, uh, you know, part of your solicitation, or you have your own content people and you just need to train them. So, really just spelling out what support is and what it isn't, you know, it helps make sure that the finish is going to price is important and you do the reach your needs you know, for the right price. Migration. So, this is a big one. We've almost done a lot of migrations over the years. Um, everything from non Drupal proprietary CMSs, older versions of up to Drupal 10, done a lot of migrations, and there are some common pitfalls that we've seen um, really around the content, right? You know, so it, it can be difficult to do content cleanup during and restructuring, you know, and redesign all as part of the migration. You know, run into all kinds of issues like, you know, you migrate some content but not others. The content that you migrate, maybe you have a page that links to another page that you're not migrating, right? How do you handle that kind of thing? You know, when you're redoing the information architecture, like do you have, you have to think through all the mapping, right? Some content, you know, you can't be migrated. You're gonna have to make new landing pages, right? Media assets, you need every single media asset copyright. If you wanna start your new Drupal site with, you know, Tens of thousands of media assets that are have you know cluttered because they're, you can't bring stuff in and have it already categorized, right? It's coming from somewhere where it's not already categorized. So it's a lot to think through with uh, migration, knowing that you know migration doesn't mean one-to-one -one feature parity, right? If you're coming from some other CMS that you know has the high-level functionality, um, same Drupal can provide the same high level functionality, but it may not work in exactly the same way, right? Migration doesn't mean that it's gonna be exactly like the system you had before, right? And understanding that, you know, how, another, another one, how are you dealing with custom code, one-off specialty content, like those things. Unfortunately, a lot of times when we see custom code that has to be migrated, it has to be reverse engineered. That can be a big time to take a lot of labor to reverse engineer custom code from an old site into a new Drupal site. All right, and I think this is my last one on technical requirements. Um, SEO and analytics, I think, you know, anybody that's worked on a government uh, site is familiar with the digital analytics program. It's basically the GSA rebranding, rebranding Google Analytics, right? Pretty familiar with that, it's pretty easy to implement. Um, but if you have, you know, if your site does require something more advanced like Telium, like that's good to know, Telium has you know, a much more in-depth implementation uh, beyond just Google Analytics. So knowing if there's a, an analytics team that has their own requirements, like go talk to that team, and make sure they understand what's in the solicitation being asked of the, of the industry, you know, so that, you know, the industry knows what, what to expect. Um, and then, you know, analytics sometimes does, sometimes does not include analysis, right? Do you actually, you know, is, is your requirement to have somebody not just collect the data, but look at the data with you, tell you what it means, make recommendations, like if you need that analysis piece, that's not by default included in, 
you know, what we see as general analytics requirements. Um, so, yeah, just understanding that, right, and, you know, making sure that industry is bringing the right skills, um, not trying to provide things that you don't need, don't need to pay for. Um, yeah. Okay. You guys have had enough for me for the I'm going to turn over the next section to you, Brian. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I'm going to hit on the CX, UX, and UI requirements. Uh, these are a checklist of things that, if possible, uh, to provide us, uh, to make sure that we're uh, being as uh, in-depth uh, on the responses for you. So the first one is, what is your level of CX maturity? Uh, also including, uh, do you need to be compliant with things like the IDEA Act? So do you have a CX roadmap already in place? Do you have research done? Do you have... Um, you know, certain uh, guidelines that are already in place and there's a team that we need to work with through that design period, it would be helpful for us to know that and link that out to us so we can make sure that we're thinking about these things beforehand before we put together a response. Um, but one major thing is the last one. Uh, no matter what your budget is, and we understand budgets can be tight, is to make sure that we have time to talk to those end users. If we're not talking to them early, understanding what their pain points are, understanding what their definition of success is, we're not going to be able to do a good project for you. Uh, and then if budget does allow for it, being able to talk to them and benchmark our process a couple times throughout the entire process to make sure that what we put together from a design perspective matches their needs. All right, All right. Uh, key performance indicators. So at the end of the day, you've launched your site, right? You're talking to your stakeholders on the government side. How are you going to be able to prove that this design, this UX initiative, is successful? Uh, and how is that going to be measured, right? Uh, was, were you having issues with discoverability? Uh, was the mega menu hard to use? Uh, were people calling into the call center? So driving down call center uh, calls, is that a metric that you needed to track? Um, are you tracking user satisfaction scores, uh, like 4C? Uh, is there a baseline number that you have right now? And then is there a number that you want to get up towards? So understanding what your definition of success is there, how you're going to be judged internally, so we can build that into our process and being able to map it and have a pathway for continuous improvement is important. All right, audience types of user research. Uh, understanding the customer. And one area that I feel that's lacking and can be very helpful for us is understanding the internal customers. Who are we going to be working with on the government side? Uh, and if possible, even provide like an org chart of every one of those individuals. Who has buy-in? Who has to have a say? How many individuals are there? I don't understand we might have a product owner, but who do they answer to? So if there was a map of all those individuals. I mean, is there five different components within that agency that we need to talk to and get feedback? Uh, that's important to know because we need to build in effective project management plans and a communication strategy to make sure that we're being mindful of their time, but being able to get in front of them, being able to present, being able to show improvements and get their feedback at the end of the day. So understanding the full breadth of those internal users is very helpful for us before we're be able to start that project. And then on the user uh, side, it's very helpful for us to know if you've already done research. Uh, do you have that persona mapped out? What is that end user for your site? Is it the broad audience of the entire citizen base? Or is it certain individuals that fall under a certain industry type? So if you've already done personas, you've already done service blueprints, please share those with us so we make sure that we're putting together a plan that best maps uh, out for them. Okay, information architecture, like the mega menu. Uh, it'd be good to understand why you're going through a process of updating that. Uh, do you have bad navigation? Do you need to improve findability? Do you need to improve SEO? And then once we go through the process of fixing that, how do you want to actually validate that these changes are successful? Uh, and then one thing to think about, when you're doing a change to the IA, are you also doing a site navigation and a content cleanup? Because when you do that, things are going to be mapped to different parts of the site. And you're also going to get broken links if you're doing the content cleanup and certain things are coming over with you. So what is that broken link strategy that you want? Uh, you want to have a page that says this content's no longer available, but if you want to get access to it, reach out to this individual, or you just want to bubble up that broken link to the parent. So understanding that there's going to be a big impact to how we do testing, how we're going to validate how things work, and combine a migration and a content, I mean, an information architecture upgrade, just understanding that from our perspective, we can make sure that we're building out better testing plans and a project plan to map that. Uh, reviews and approvals kind of comes back to the concept of understanding who internally we're working with 
And again, if it's possible, give us an org chart of that. Uh, who actually has final say? Is there a product owner that speaks for everybody? Is it a web committee? Is it a series of stakeholders that represent the different components that are using the site? So understanding how many there are and then understanding that there's more of them, it's going to be more difficult for us to map and communicate with them. Understanding those types of things are important. And then lastly, uh, what are your expectations on rounds of designs? So two, is it three types of designs so we can make sure that we're staffing the project appropriately with the number of designers. And page type templates and components. If possible, can you please give us uh, an inventory of all the page type templates and components because that will help us map out how long it might take to do uh, redesign. And within that component uh, category, understanding what your desired level of customization is. Does you need to be able to change like the fonts, the font colors, you need to move things to left and right, do animated GIFs and videos and images. Like how much customization and capability to control that component do you need to give your content editors? So we can plan out how much design time that's going to be needed to do that, make sure that it's responsive and flexible, but also understanding from a designer's uh, developer standpoint, that's scope. And it's going to be how long is it going to take to build out that functionality. I'm going to move into the business development requirements. So I want to hit on things like project management, tools, uh, key personnel, staffing, documentation, reporting, training user guides, Authority to operate, uh, and my favorite badging requirements. So on the project management side, um, it's just helpful to understand what you're comfortable with and what your team is comfortable with as far as the project management approach. Are you more comfortable with waterfall? Has your team found success with that? That's fine, just make that clear and we'll put in a project management plan that best fits with that. If your team has been trained in Agile and you've had success doing that in Agile, we'll also put in the project management that fits that. But I do feel like there needs to be good alignment with your team, what their, you know, their capabilities are, how they've been trained, and we'll put the appropriate project management plan in place that fits within your culture so we can be successful and ultimately bring value to the citizen. Um, it's also good to understand how you want to be involved with the ticket process. Do you want to be the one that signs off on the ticket or the definition of done? Are you going to be testing that final ticket and moving it over? Or do you want to kind of just see capabilities and demonstrations and do very robust testing at the very end. We've seen requirements for both, so just understanding that we're working within your time frame, uh, so what would you like to see uh, from that would be helpful. And then on the security front, 508 scans. Uh, if we're required to do security scanning, when do you want to see that done? Is that when we deliver functions uh, at the end of a sprint, and then it goes to a team that does security scans? How long does that take to get back? Is that two weeks, is that three weeks? It's helpful for us to understand that so we can build that into our cadence and we know when the true definition of done is. And then lastly, what kind of tools that are you comfortable using uh, or required to use? Uh, are there FedRAM compliant tools like um, that we'd have to come in and get access to? Or are you expecting the contractor or herself to have tools like Jira and Confluence for running the project? So making it clear which ones are available and which you'd like to use is very helpful for us. Key personnel and staffing. Uh, now I'm going to be speaking on this from a small business perspective. We do feel like representational resumes paint a better picture of an agency or a contractor's ability to, uh, per, you know, what their bench is, what their skill sets are, uh, and we can focus more on outcomes, goals, and deliverables. As we all know, deadlines do get pushed. Uh, if there is a protest that moves things back 90 days to over a year, so as a small business, to be able to have a key personnel available on those start dates can be difficult. So if we can focus more on representational resumes and showcase the skill sets of that, uh, that firm, I feel like we can be uh, better suited to provide value to you. And again, coming back to that org chart concept of who we're going to be working with on the government side. If we can, you don't need to give names, but if you can give us the different types of individuals we're working with, what their requirements and their say is, that helps us plan a better communication and strategy. Okay, documentation and reporting, if possible. Please provide examples of what you would like to see done and the frequency in which they need to be done. Um, so if do you just want meeting minutes or do you need very complex kind of documentation put together that we need a technical writer staff for? Uh, I understand that certain agencies have regulatory environment reporting uh, requirements, so if you could list those out, maybe even link out to the documentation for those so we can plan. Then also kind of let us know if you need any SBOM or um, 
uh, SCRM type of documentation put in place. Uh, so just as detailed as you can be, letting us know how much uh, documentation needs to be done, the level of detail that needs to be put in place, and how frequently it needs to be there, we could effectively staff the project correctly. Okay, training and user guides. Uh, first off, it would be very useful to know exactly how many people need to be trained. Is it five, is it 50, is it 300? And then after that, where are they located? Are they in the building with you, or are they spread out across the United States? Uh, you know your staff better than we do. If you can help us understand what is the best methodology to actually train those individuals. Do they like to get video-based guides? Do they want to do in-person training where we train 20 people at a time? Do you want interactive e-modules or like PDF guides enough? So if you can provide us what you know is a successful training methodology, we can build that into our plan. Uh, but you know, really right off the bat, if you can let us know the exact number or even a ballpark number of how many people need to be trained, we can produce a better result for you. All right, authority to operate. Um, so depending on what is needed, uh, we can put the right person in place. So uh, do you already have an ATO in place? And if so, are we just providing data calls to get it updated? Or is it something that you need to do from scratch? Right, so do you need us to help write the SSP and the POAM? Who's required to write these types of things out? Who's gonna you know, be required to um, get approvals for them? Uh, and understanding that level of uh, involvement and then when do you need that ETO put into a place helps us uh, you know, staff accordingly uh, and know exactly what our requirements are. Okay, badging. Uh, so if possible, provide us the details about how long it takes to get somebody back. Is it two weeks, is it three months, is it six months, or is it a big question mark? Knowing that, we're gonna be able to make sure that our people are filling out their paperwork and getting their fingerprints done at the right time, but also we have a good idea when we're building out a timeline when we can expect people to be putting hands on keyboard and producing product for you. Uh, same thing applies with the GFE. Uh, you know, what type of specs are those? Uh, but also how long does it take to get one? And then at what point can we get access to them? Is it from the kickoff date? Or do they have to get their security done first and then the GFE is sent over? So understanding those time periods helps us uh, better produce a you know, plan and a project plan uh, to you know, build out the product. And then lastly, uh, we recommend that the government allows for surge uh, staffing, so more individuals who are involved in the day-to-day -day have badging, so in case somebody is sick, someone goes on vacation, you know, someone has a baby, uh, or if you have a new soap that you want to include, we're able to bring people into that project without having to go through the security uh, process. They can just step right in, mitigate risk, keep the project on, sta uh, on time uh, that way. Cool. Uh, Jason? All right. Now our last but not least section, uh, talking about pricing and budget, right? This is to be one of the more sensitive areas of, a, of an RFP. Uh, and, and really just have one slide on this, on the pricing stuff. Um, and really the ask here is to just give industry some indication of, you know, how they might, you know, what guide they might have to, to price out your project. If, if you, you know, we've seen some RFPs that actually list a budget for the work, right? Like that if, if there's no, I don't think there's any FAR law or anything that says as a, as a federal agency you can't show a budget, right? So like if you have a budget, it's okay to put that in your solicitation. That way we can make sure we, you know, align a plan that fits within that cost, right? Um, if you don't have a budget, maybe the work's been done before and you at least have a previous award that you can refer the industry to to so, know like it was the work was previously being done at approximately this price, right? If you don't have either of those, you don't wanna, you know, don't or can't uh, give a dollar amount in the solicitation, estimated level of effort. We've seen um, seen a solicitation not all that long ago where clearly stated, you know, government expects this work that we want done to be approximately 22,000 labor hours, right? So if, and again, I'm, I'm not sure like how that number was derived, but seeing it in the solicitation gave us a good idea of like, okay, 22,000 hours is a team of roughly this size, we know to meet the requirements, you know, this QA person is going to be half time, this is analyst is full time, you right? two developers, stuff like that. So, you know, if you have a current team that's doing work, let us know what that team size is. Um, you know, for industry, these are also the types of 
questions that you can ask back to the government if you really have no idea how to ask somebody, you know, asking a, you know, who the incumbent is, what the previous war was, what the current team size is, if you can get, you know, that kind of, those kind of questions asked to the government can help you, you know, with your pricing. Um, another thing with regard to pricing is, you know, a lot of, a lot of solicitations will have, you know, here are tasks that are divided up into cleanse, you know, these are required, and these are optional. One of the really difficult things I've seen, you know, in, in a couple of solicitations is where you have one CLIN that you need to price, and it includes both required and optional tasks. Like, it's really confusing to figure out how to come up with a price, a line item price or something that could, you know, contain required and optional tasks. So, just clearly spelling out which tasks you expect to be optional, right, and, and knowing, like, you know, we're trying to price the win for the required stuff, knowing that the optional stuff may require additional funding that may not exist yet, just having it clearly delineated, you know, um, so that everybody knows what to expect. Um, LPTA versus best value, for those who don't know, LPTA lowest price, technically acceptable. Um, you know, if it really is a tight budget on the government side, LPTA might be the better fit for you. It, it can also exclude some companies. I know it's, we typically shy away from solicitations that uh, can specify that they're LPTA. It basically means that you know the lowest price wins as long as it's technically acceptable. Um, and then even for the best value stuff, right? There's still obviously price is still a factor when it comes to a best value evaluation. But knowing you know if it's still largely if still 90% of the evaluation criteria is the price and only 10% is on you know corporate capabilities, things like that. Just kind of spelling that out so the industry knows like, you know, how much they're gonna to have to differentiate themselves or if it's truly just, you know, a race at the bottom on the price. Um, time and zeros versus FFP, right? Just you know, what does the work kind of lend itself to? Um, I, I mean I think time and zeros makes more sense for agile type projects. Um, but, you know, also that can, you know, I know the, but the government has to have a budget, has to have certainty around that budget, so sometimes it's t &M with the ceiling, you know, versus FFP, firm fixed price, should hopefully have fixed requirements, which is, you know, typically less agile, I mean, you know, you can't change the requirements. And then, last but not least, payment schedule. Um, again, speaking as a small business, right, I know it, it, it's, in some ways, it, it makes sense for the government to desire a milestone payment schedule that, you know, when you deliver X feature, you get paid this amount. Well, as a small business, it can be very difficult if those, you know, you have these big, huge milestones that take three months to accomplish, right? We have to pay for our staff for those three months, right, in order to get one big chunk of deliverable, you know. The other aspect of, of milestone payments that's challenging is, you know, having someone available for review. I mean, what if we, uh, you know, get a feature completed right before the person on the government side goes on vacation? And, you know, there's another delay. And what is the criteria for getting, you know, a milestone approved to for payment? So, you know, it sounds good in theory, but I think milestone payments, you know create a lot more work and overhead, the approval process and the invoicing side, right? So, you know, don't um, don't be afraid to, you know, let the industry do a standard payment schedule, same amount every month, right? If it's kind of zeros or whatever. In conclusion, here's uh, some news and notes. These are again primarily targeted at our uh, Government audience, right? Just a few dues. Um, if you're putting, if you're putting together RFPs or you're on a team that's helping to put them together, you know, I think we, you know, kind of beat it to death. Provide as many technical details as possible about your project. Obviously, there are restrictions. You cannot show anything that, you know, uh, would open up any security vulnerabilities like server names or IP addresses. But it, otherwise, like. Tooling, any technical details, where it's hosted, like that you can provide, is you know even beyond just like the requirements you have for the functionality. Um, clearly explain which tools you're using, and that industry is going to be required to use versus 
things that are open that you're open to change or that you want suggestions on, right? Um, knowing that you know you're looking for a better solution for you know let's say your the ticketing system, right? Versus the CICD tool is that maybe that one's already decided by another group, and you know we're stuck with just knowing which tools are you know open to change versus required. Um, any data you have, right? Brian talked about this for your customer experience goals, um, and knowing who's going to participate in that, you know, include that, or at least have thought about it, right? Um, knowing that that's going to be a requirement to accomplish those customer experience requirements. Brian mentioned, you know, consider if the project is better suited for waterfalls instead of agile, right? Waterfall is not a four letter word. I mean, every government RFP talks about agile. If it's not agile, that's okay. Um, just what really fits better for you. Um, strongly consider doing a public beta launch if your project is agile. Uh, we've seen that work really well for some of our projects where, you know, you keep the legacy site out there, but you create a beta.whatever.gov, and if you make it publicly available, it can really mitigate a lot of risk um, by having it out there and make the, the, the cutover launch activities a lot less stressful if you do a public beta. Um, yeah, describing the management process, the level of documentation that you expect, and, you know, again, anything, any information you should provide with regard to pricing and budget. Right, industry, I think, will try to come up with the best plan to meet that criteria if we know what it is, we know what your budget is. Uh, if you don't, right, don't expect the industry to have an intimate knowledge of your technical environment. Don't expect that just because we work with, you know, one uh, agent, department under Department of Commerce that it's going to be the same way for another uh, customer under Department of Commerce. We see Lots of variety, even within one department, right? So don't expect that the uh, industry is going to have an instant knowledge of, of what your compliance rules are, what your tooling is. It's, it's good to spell that stuff out. Uh, I mentioned this one before. Don't assume that a migration is the same as one-to-one -one feature parity. That you know, just because we're pulling over, over all your content, that like the workflow is going to be the same. You know, the, the content entry product, the editorial process is going to be the same. Migration doesn't mean one-to-one -one future parity. Um, don't require CX improvements without data and resources to achieve them, right? As Brian mentioned, we need to know who these users are. We need to have people available to talk to. Like, make sure if you have CX requirements that you have the resources like, to, to work with industry to um, achieve those. And don't expect the, the CX process to continue throughout development. That's, unfortunately, we've seen that a few times where we're doing design up until you know a month or two before launch, right? And like you know, the development team is coding something one way. Somehow the design changes. They're recoding it, recoding it because you know that design process, that customer experience, that process does need to come to an end, and there needs to be time to you know get it finished, getting it built out, so it can't continue all the way through to the development. Um, this one I don't want it to sound passive aggressive, but it kind of does. Don't ask the industry for uh, suggestions. If there's no intention for changing tools and processes, we've seen this before where government asks, you know, industry, provide us recommendations on where we should host our site. And we give them one answer, and they're like, no, nope, don't like that, just try again. We give them another answer, no, nope, no, like, we give them a third answer, and they're like, yeah, well, if they already have, we already have a, a solution, just prescribe it. It's okay. Don't don't try to validate the, your, the notion of a particular solution, you know, by hoping that we recommend what you already want. Um, don't require a full waterfall project plan for an agile project. Right? We touched on this again. Waterfall, not a full letter word. In fact, it makes more sense if there are certain requirements. Right? And if you really are agile, it's hard to give you a perfect schedule from, you know, kickoff all the way through launch, right? But it's, it's hard to take a, you know, satisfy a mixture of agile principles and waterfall principles. So, you know, it's better off to try to pick the one that works best for you. Um, and then the last one, you know, if, you know, you think that 
not providing any information about uh, how what your budget is, you think that will re result in lower estimates and probably won't. In fact, you know, more often than not, I think what will happen is you may get some lowball quotes from firms that probably can't end up delivering, and then you have other firms who, because they have no idea, they will just you know pad everything and be way outside of your budget because they don't know what it is, and they, you know that's one way for them to mitigate the risk. So um, yeah, just a few do's and don'ts from us, and I think we're yeah we're right at time. So. Uh, that concludes our presentation. Thank you, everybody. Here after.